And good morning to those of you watching online. You know, we're in uh, about the fourth week of a series called Gardens to, or Graves to Gardens, and it's really about spiritual transformation as Paul describes it in Romans chapters 6 through 8. And today, uh, we're going to look at an aspect of it that's uh, challenging. But before I get into that, I wanted to share a little bit with you. Last week, um, Cookie and I spent the week in Tennessee with our kids, meeting our new grandson, and that's been a great thing and all that. And I thought, you know, while we're in Nashville, um, let's take a little three-day trip uh, just to kind of continue the celebration of our 40th anniversary. We were originally scheduled uh, to go to Napa Valley and spend our, you know, anniversary in San Francisco and go down the coast to California. Then between COVID and California being on fire, it just didn't seem like a good idea. So we put that off. We spent a few days in Michigan a month or so ago, which was fantastic. And so we thought, you know, Let's go to Gatlinburg. We've heard so many good things about it, and then we can go, you know, we're, we're mountain people. We love the mountains, and we thought we'll go into the Smokies, and, you know, we'll hike a little bit, but we couldn't make any reservations or plans until, you know, little baby boy came along, and so we found out when he was born the next day, we found out we were going down there the next day, and, and I thought, well, okay, I'll get on there, and we'll get some nice, quaint little cabin up in the mountains on a day's notice during peak leaf season, close to the sm Smoky Mountains, and you could almost hear the search engine laughing at me. <laughs> and so I got a cheap hotel, not in downtown Gatlinburg, in downtown Pigeon Forge. Now think of the name. I mean, of course, who names a town Pigeon, but there's a river that runs through there. Anyway, I, we didn't know what to expect, but I remember after three days of being there, and we, we did a nice hike up in the Smokies and got to hike part of the you know, Appalachian Trail, which was kind of a bucket list thing. I was sitting on our deck overlooking one of the probably 12 go-kart tracks. It had to be about 12 feet from the room. And if you've ever been to Pigeon Forge, it's like five miles of carnival. I kind of describe it as kind of hillbilly, um, you know, Vegas. And uh, I felt like after three days, I was on a three-day um, episode of Hee Haw. Remember Hee Haw back in the 70s? That's kind of what it felt like. So I was kind of feeling sorry for myself, thinking, is this the best I can do for my bride of 40 years? And I'm, I'm looking at these kids in this, like, swim pool resort hotel thing across the street, just one of the other many attractions with everything else. And uh, I'm kind of feeling sorry for myself, feeling like I'm suffering a little bit. And I hear the siren go off. These kids are just swimming completely oblivious to it. And it dawned on me, as it often does when I hear a siren, somebody is having the worst day of their life. And it made me think about what we're talking, going to talk about today. And that is that we live in a world where suffering is not an abnormality. It is a reality. And it is more of a normal part of life. And it's, it's certainly not something, you know, you like to dwell on, you like to think about, but it's real. And Paul addresses it in chapter 8, and we're going to look at verses 13 through 27 today in Romans chapter 8. And if you want to follow along in your Bible or on your U version, or of course, we'll have the verses up on the screens, we're going to talk about how suffering plays a critical role in spiritual transformation, that how God uses suffering and it's not something we even like to theologize about, but you can't avoid it. You can't escape it if you actually read the Bible with, with open eyes and an open heart. So today we're going to look at that. And, and, you know, Paul talks about this. And so I'm just going to read you verses 13 through 27. And then we're going to kind of work our way through those, that section of scripture. Beginning with verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, and, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. 
We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now, Paul warns us, he gives us a warning in this passage about suffering. He, he tells us that it's part of the reality of the world we live in. If you look at verses 22 and 23, he says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship and the redemption of our bodies. And it's an interesting term that he uses here um, for groan. He's, it's, it's, it's this idea of childbirth. And you got to consider childbirth and the mortality rate of childbirth in, in the, day, the days in which Paul wrote this. It was about a 10% mortality rate. About one out of every 10 women died during childbirth. And this groan that you would hear apparently, according to historians, was that, that, this, that I'm in mortal danger. You almost are looking death square in the face, square in the eyes. And it's just kind of groaning. And, I, and I've, I've, I've heard from combat veterans that one of the most awful things about war is after the battle, the firefight is over, you hear the groaning of wounded comrades, wounded soldiers in the field that are actually staring at their own death and this groan, this kind of mortal danger. That's what Paul is talking about here. And he, he speaks of this, this, this whole idea that, that we, the, all of creation is kind of in mortal danger. We are groaning over what we see around us. There's this idea of suffering. And he speaks of it in verses 20 and 21 that all of creation is experiencing this. He says, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. And in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And this begs that question, why did God create the potential for such pain and suffering in this life? Because he chose to give us free will. Knowing that when he gave us free will to choose to either love and serve him or not, that there was a great risk involved in that. But true love is only love that is given freely, not forced. He could have forced us and he could have programmed in us that we were going to obey him and, and love him, but he gave us free will. And as a result, sin entered the world from the very, very beginning. And ever since then, we have been, as Paul describes it, in bondage to decay. Now, what is he talking about here? Think of the second law of thermodynamics where everything is dying. Everything is burning out. Our sun, our stars, our earth, your heart. Not to bum you out, we're going to try to, you know, move this thing back in an upward trajectory in a minute, but you can't skirt around the truth because Paul doesn't. You have so many beats in your heart. It's like a wind-up clock. Sooner or later, there's going to be a last beat. Everyone you know and everything you know in life is now in the process of decay, of changing. Even your loved ones. In a way, time is picking us apart one by one, by one. And the older I get, the more apparent that becomes to me that my body is not made for eternity because someone put it best a while back when they said, you know you're getting older when you wake up injured. You have no idea why. Because we are changing, we are decaying. So what is the point here? We live in a culture of denial, don't we? about this issue of pain and suffering. We, we live in a culture because we want to avoid suffering as though it's an abnormality. And we even create theologies to help us avoid that. If you have enough faith, if you claim the right things, if you rid your life of sin, then suddenly you're going to live forever. Where do we read this in the scripture? Certainly not in Paul's writings. We're all in the bondage of decay. And suffering is a real unavoidable part of life. 
And Paul says, this is the reality, and so you need some help in dealing with it, and God is there to give us the help. And what I want to talk about as he, like, lays it out in, in this section of Scripture, he gives us three tools or three resources to help us deal with suffering and deal with pain when it comes our way, and it will. So let's look at those three resources for suffering. The first one should come as no surprise to you. It is this thing called prayer. You know, they, they say, the, the old saying, and I don't think this is absolutely true, but there are no atheists in foxholes, right? You know, when you're under duress, when you're suffering, when you're in pain, everybody believes, everybody's going to throw a, a prayer up there like, hey, if anybody's up there, please help. We all, we all you know, everybody, I, in, in 40 years, of, almost 40 years of being a pastor, I've not once, it'll probably happen this week, but I've not once had a person turn me down when I offered to pray for them. Even if they've never claimed to have any faith whatsoever, when they're going through a difficult time, everybody wants to believe there might be something out there. I was reminded of that, and I thought about a, a whitewater rafting trip uh, that I went on several years ago. Some of you probably remember it. We had a group of guys every fall that would go to West Virginia, Beckley, West Virginia, to raft the Gully River. The Gully River is one of the top 10 whitewater rafting experiences in the world, and it's right here in West Virginia, and, and, and it's six weekends a year, and we would take a group of guys down there every year for, I don't know, five or six years, and it was so fun after you'd been there a couple times, and you knew what to expect, what they do is there's a dam called the Summersville Dam, which is, is on the New River, and they open it up six weekends a year to kind of control the water level. And so, you know, all these guys, you know how guys are, they're going, oh, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Well, you know, maybe we're going to flip out of the raft and they're all macho and talking smack and everything, you know, real tough guys, until you pull the bus that you ride on down around right by the dam. And you got about six or eight of these, like, shoots that are just shoot. You feel like you're right under a 747. It is terrifying. Suddenly, these macho, tough guys become like whimpering little boys. And, and, and on one of the trips, and it does, you, you tighten right up, man. I mean, it's like scary, but it's so fun if you're, you know, into that kind of thing. One of the guys that went with us one year was an acquaintance, a friend of mine who claimed to be an atheist, who claimed to have no faith whatsoever. And so he's kind of, we we're getting down and getting ready to get in the raft. And I got in the front of the raft on one side and he goes, hey, Denny, he goes, I'm going to sit next to you just in case you're right. <laughs> no atheists in foxholes, right? But that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about prayer for those of us who are Christ followers, who are children of God. And it's a very different kind of prayer. It's something very different in verses 14 and 15. He describes it for us. And this is one of the greatest resources we have when we're going through suffering, if we properly understand it. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. You've probably heard one of us talking about this idea, this idea of Abba, Father. It's we can address him as Daddy. It literally means daddy. And, you know, think about it. That's one of the first words that a child learns is Papa or Abba or Daddy or some version of that. And, and what Paul is saying is God hears our cries like a parent hears their baby's cry. And, and I've experienced that very recently. It's so interesting. It's, it's an instinctive thing that a parent has. You don't have to teach a newborn mother to react. It's almost like an out-of-body experience when her child, her newborn is crying or wailing or weeping or something that doesn't sound normal. I mean, they spring into action. Moms and dads both. That's what God does for us. I, I was reminded of, of, of this, um, back in 1987, uh, there was a situation with a, a little girl named Jessica McClure. She was a little girl in Texas, 18 months old. I read up on that just, just because of the sermon today. And she, fell, she lived in Texas. She fell into a 22-foot well in the backyard of her parents' or grandparents' house. She was trapped in there for 57 hours. They rescued her. It was all over the news and everything, and she was okay. Well, about four years later, we're on a family vacation up in Michigan with my sisters and her, my sister and her family and little kids. And our daughter, Caitlin, was oh, maybe 18 months, about the same age as Jessica McClure. And one evening, the kids were all playing in this, this condo. And, and all of a sudden, I hear Caitlin just screaming and crying. And one of the other kids goes, she fell into a hole. I'm thinking, in the house? Well, I, I ran to the, where the, the cry was. And there was a little crawl space under the stairwell and that one of the kids had pulled the lid of it off. 
And I didn't know what was down there. I didn't know it was a 22-foot well. I didn't know what it was. I didn't think it was that, but I didn't think about that. My daughter is in a hole. I can't see her. She's crying. I go diving into that hole, not knowing if it's 22 feet or what. It's about a foot and a half, which was good, <laughs> on a sandy floor. But it didn't matter to me. It could have been 1,000 feet deep. My child was in there in danger, or so I thought, and I was going to go to her rescue. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. Our father in heaven is like for us when he hears us cry out, when he hears us groan as though we are in mortal danger, Abba, daddy. And if we as human parents do that, how much better is our perfect father in heaven? But in addition to that, and this is, this is something, this, this next part, you guys, if you don't hear anything else I say today, this is, this is really big stuff here. Not because I'm saying it, because Paul did. But in addition, the Holy Spirit prays for us when we're in such deep groaning and suffering that we don't even know what to pray for, for ourselves. Look at verse 26. Paul says, in the same way, the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, who lives in all of us as followers of Christ, helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now, you know, I thought for years, this might be referring to a private prayer language of tongues or whatever, but, you know, I, I, I can go with that. But I, don't, I think it's more than that. I think it's something very different than that. I think what Paul is talking about here is the difference between an informed and a mature prayer and a stupid prayer. We all pray stupid prayers sometimes, don't we? Now, let me explain to you what, what I'm talking about. When I was in college, I thought I met the one. I did meet the one, but not the first, the one I thought I met. The one girl that I thought I was you know, gonna spend the rest of my life with and you know, in love and all that. And it was nothing that resembled a godly relationship. And I wasn't even following Jesus or anything like that. And after about a year, she broke up with me. I was crushed. I was devastated. And I remember just praying these stupid prayers like, God, help me. You know, she's the one and blah, blah, blah. And he didn't answer me. He was just silent. You ever felt that way? It's like, come on, God. I thought you loved me enough to give me what I want. Stupid prayer. We didn't. Well, then, you know, you guys know the story. A year or so later, I met Cookie, and we've lived happily ever after. So here's my point. When I was praying that stupid prayer, it seemed as though God was not answering, but what God was really doing was he was giving me the answer that I would have asked for if I knew what he knew. Does that make sense to you? I didn't know what he knows. I didn't know what he knew. I still don't. But when I'm like, yeah, you know, stupid prayer, you know, God, give me that parking spot at the mall at Christmas right up front next to the store, which isn't going to be a problem this Christmas, by the way. <laughs> or give me that new car, or give me that whatever. That's a stupid prayer. But even when we pray stupid prayer, the, the Spirit intercedes for us, and he prays what we would be praying if we knew what he knows. If I were to pray that same prayer today, that I prayed in 1978, I would have prayed a much wiser prayer. I would have prayed for a cookie. I would have prayed for the life that God has given me. I just didn't know that life existed yet, but God did. And that's what it means that the Spirit intercedes for us. He gives us the answer that we would have prayed for knowing what he knows. And so, as you approach God, even if you don't know what to pray or know what to say, if you're angry, if you're frustrated, if you're emotional, just approach the throne of God confidently, knowing that because the Holy Spirit lives in you and he is your Abba Father, he's got it and he'll guide you. It may not be the answer you want right away, but ultimately, and now I know this is a lot tougher in some circumstances and I'm not gonna minimize the pain that some of you have experienced, and sometimes I just frankly don't know what God is up to. But I'm seeing the longer I'm a Christ follower and the more experience I have walking with God, the more even some of the most horrendous things ultimately can be okay. 
not great, but okay. And one day we'll know that they're great. But in the meantime, we have to trust him. So the first tool he gives us, the first resource he gives us is prayer. The second one is he gives us a pattern for suffering. In verse 17, we read, now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I mean, have you ever like, so if God, if you loved me, why? If you loved us, why? Why do you let such terrible things happen? If you loved us, why, why do all of these happen? Because we experience the same thing Jesus did. Jesus never allows us to go through anything that he has not gone through. You know, in my worst days, I'll sometimes just resort to this thing. Okay, it's really bad. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm upset. But I have not yet been nailed to a cross for doing nothing wrong. And so if we expect that we're going to experience the resurrection of Christ, why would we think that we're not going to go through the death and the burial and the suffering with Christ? Why do we think that we can avoid that somehow if even God himself in the flesh did not avoid that? And as much as it pains me to say this, but it is so true, sometimes the only thing that is going to transform us and change us is pain and suffering. I mean, look what Paul says earlier in Romans in chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. He says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, which is really hard to do, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Death must precede resurrection. Self must die in order to live for Christ and others, right? So it gives us these first two resources, prayer and a, and, a, and a pattern. And the last one is where I want to kind of land this today. He gives, if we allow him to, he will give us his perspective. And now what, what do I mean by that? It's, it's his view of life. Paul, I think, had that. Look at verse 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul seemed to have a very developed idea of heaven. And the way you see things matters a great deal in life. The way, your perspective, the way you look at something can make you or break you. I was thinking of this. I, I heard this a while back, the story of two men. It's a, it's a made-up story, I'm sure, but it's, it preaches. These two guys were given the same job for a year. They did a menial task. I don't know what it was, but it was a menial task, something totally boring, same two men, 12 hours a day, seven days a week for 12 months. The first man was promised a salary of $15,000 if he did this job for 12 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days, every day, 15,000. The other man was given the same job, menial task, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days for $150 million. Which one do you think had the better perspective? Obviously, the guy was going to get $150 million. There's a lot you, you will do for a year for $150 million. And, and, and so these guys' perspective made it a, a big deal. Now, I say that to try to make the point that how you deal with suffering is largely shaped by your view of heaven by your view of life after death, by your view of eternity. The way you deal with suffering, you know, I hear people say, well, you know, faith is a crutch and, and you talk about all that and this and that. Well, after doing hundreds and hundreds of funerals and dealing with a lot of people over the years that are very, very sick and probably on the verge of dying who are going through unspeakable tragedies, let me tell you something. A belief in heaven really makes a difference. It matters a great deal because we do not suffer like those who have no hope. And, and that's what Paul was trying to tell us. Suffering is going to come your way. Loss is going to come your way. But anything less than an eternal perspective in life is going to create a life of anxiety. Look at verses 19 through 21. And he says, this is what we have to look forward to. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. God even says we will be liberated from our bondage, the bondage we're into this decaying world around us 
and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And here's the cool part about that. If you understand what Paul is saying here, as we are liberated, as, as we are restored and, and transformed, nature will follow. You see, heaven, heaven is going to be this amazing place. This restoration is going to be a place where what was sad will be unsad and what is broken will be unbroken. It's going to be a place much like this, but way better. I think we have this picture, this faulty picture of heaven that, you know, we're bouncing around the clouds playing a harp and no, I mean, heaven is going to be this before the fall. People are like, well, am I going to know the people I love in heaven? Yeah, of course you are. Now, I don't know how the whole multiple marriage thing works out and all that. That's above my pay grade. But what I do believe with all of my heart is that heaven is going to be this, but perfect. This, but better. This, but everything you ever dreamed of. Stuff you can't even imagine right now. You guys know I love to snow ski. It's, to me, it's this. 72 and sunny and four feet of fresh powder. That's impossible in this broken, decaying world, but not in the next one. And here's the thing. I've said this before, and then I'm going to read you something, and we're going to close with a song to celebrate it. But I'm going to say this again, and it probably gets annoying to some of you, but if, if it's possible that we're sitting here doing this right now, why is more beyond life so hard to believe? Why is it hard to believe? Why is it such a stretch for us? It's because the enemy blinds us. So several, several years ago, I heard a quote by um, C.S. Lewis. It was in one of his books. Uh, Pain is God's megaphone to get our attention. And then a few years after that, a friend of mine, K.T. Kashan, who's a retired surgeon, gave me a book that has just changed my view forever of pain. It was written by one of my favorite authors, Philip Yancey. He co-authored it with a, uh, a retired physician, a British physician named Paul Brand. It's called The Gift of Pain. Now, that was a very odd title. Who's going to buy that, right? But we all struggle with pain and suffering. And basically, the premise of the book was how pain is a gift. Pain is necessary. Paul Brand, this British uh, physician, spent his entire career dealing with people with leprosy. And uh, basically, one of the misunderstandings of leprosy, he said, is that leprosy, the disease itself, is what eats away your skin and deforms and, and disfigures you. And that's not it at all. What happens with people who have leprosy is they lose their sense of feeling. They can't feel pain. They can't feel anything. And so they could stub their toe, cut their toe, burn their foot, get an infection, get a, an illness. They have no sense of feeling, so they can't feel. Pain is a gift by God to us saying something is wrong. And we don't typically see it that way, right? We avoid it at all costs, but it's necessary for survival. I believe the suffering and the pain we feel in life, bear with me, is a gift from God to remind us that this earth is not our home. And if we get too comfortable here, it can pretty quickly get uncomfortable with suffering and pain and loss. So, I want to read you something that I read almost at all funerals because I think it talks about the hope that we have. And I'd love for you to stand as I read this. You don't have to, you don't have to read along with me. It's a description of what it's going to be like. It's in Revelation chapter 21. It starts with verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, did you hear I said, I knew a new heaven and a new earth, like this, but better. For the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. This is the part I love so much. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. 
He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. That's to us. So let's end our time together today celebrating the beauty of that truth.